What we're going to do now is introduce the classical view on the operation of the macro economy, and we're going to do it graphically with some explanation. We'll also discuss the classical model in a little broader context with some of the assumptions behind it. But I think using this aggregate supply, aggregate demand model, we can lay out the basics of the classical view on the operation of the macro economy. And if we understand their point of view and their reasoning, we can understand the policy prescriptions that they tend to advocate. Now, when I say the classical model here, this is going to be the background behind what has several terms these days, sometimes called the neoclassical approach, uh, sometimes called the neoliberal approach, but in that context, liberal uh, closely uh, associates itself, at least in the United States, with the conservative point of view. The concept, probably everybody can, can hone in on, that free markets and a very small role for government are the most essential ingredients for the successful operation of the economy. Free markets. You can think of this as the laissez-faire model, right? Capitalism. So let's see how that works. And to illustrate the beliefs and principles behind this, we're going to start off by describing the aggregate supply curve in this view. All right? Now remember, along our horizontal axis, our output axis, there was some maximum level of output, full employment GDP or full employment output. And when we talk about a classical model, we're talking about a model where markets work and they work incredibly well and because of the freedom of markets to adjust that in this world the economy will always be moving towards or residing at a full employment equilibrium. Now, that's, bear with me, that's kind of important but see the way we explain it. We, we do it by drawing the aggregate supply curve as a vertical line. And when you see that vertical aggregate supply curve on any sort of a graph, the first thing you ought to be thinking is, hmm, it looks like a classical model. All right? Looks like a model that assumes markets are really powerful, really smooth and efficient, work quickly, etc. And then we'll draw an aggregate demand curve. I'm going to draw it up here a little high. Let's say that that's the aggregate demand curve number one, our starting point. And so our initial equilibrium in this economy is at point A. Let's just start there as an assumption. What's going on? Well, at this equilibrium, we have full employment. What's the unemployment rate there? As we said before, we're going to assume it to be about a 5% natural rate of unemployment. That's structural and frictional or transitional unemployment. We start at point A. And then... Let's look back and see through history, for example, in the United States, perhaps the Great Depression of the 1930s. What happened and how do we show that with this model? Well, what was aggregate demand? Aggregate demand is the total spending going on in the economy in the purchase of GDP, final goods and services. Remember that? That was business, uh, consumer spending plus business spending called investment plus government spending at all levels of government plus net exports. That was our total spending. That is, by definition. But suppose there is some shock to this system. We call it an exogenous shock, maybe something from outside, that causes one or more of these elements of, of spending to decrease. Consumers get very worried, and they start saving money instead of spending it. Businesses get very pessimistic. They're afraid they won't have customers, and so they cut back production. Governments decide for whatever reason they need to reduce the scope of their operations and they cut back spending. Those are the three biggies, right? We'll worry with the foreign sector later. But when you have a, a significant reduction in spending, how would we show that on this graph? And we would show it as a decrease in aggregate demand. So the aggregate demand curve goes from 81, decreases or shifts to the left to aggregate demand 2. And you may jump at first and say, oh, well, then we'll go from A to B. But no, we don't go straight from here to here immediately. Remember, any market has got to have time to adjust to the changed circumstances. 
In this case, we're going to go from point A over here to point B temporarily. This is not a point of equilibrium, the intersection of supply and demand. This is a point of disequilibrium, that what's going on at B, and this is important, at point B, your economy has sunk into a recession or perhaps a depression. Look, what's going on? Your level of output, or spending, let's say, is at Q, let's call it Q sub depression. Okay? That as spending fell, businesses lost customers and sales, and they responded by laying off employees. The unemployment rate rose, let's say, from 5% to 20%. And as they laid off these employees, what happened to spending in the economy? Well, it continued to decrease because when you lose your job, you stop spending as much money. And it becomes a multiplicative process. We don't have sales, we lay off employees. Everybody's laying off employees, we still have even fewer sales. Lay off some more employees, repeating itself. And so we've moved from A to B, but notice what else has happened. We haven't changed our prices yet. We're still operating at the same price level. And as businesses find that they can't do any good, well, they're afraid to drop prices, right? Because if you drop prices, the next thing you know, you're selling your products at a loss. You can't stay in business doing that. So what's going to go on? What's going on at point B? At point B, we have lousy sales, very high unemployment, and businesses are standing around saying, what are we going to do? And workers are, are, what are workers doing? Workers are out there on the street saying, I, I need a job. Somebody give me a job. Now, the adjustment process is what we really want to emphasize here is how do we wind up getting from B back to an equilibrium over here at point C? And so the movement from B to C is what I'm calling the adjustment process, the way the economy adjusts to this huge decrease in aggregate demand. And it's really kind of short and sweet, okay? What happens? Well, first thing is you have huge unemployment, and we have a lot of unemployment in economics. We call that a surplus, right? We have a surplus of workers who can't find jobs. And anytime you've got a surplus of something, what happens to its price? its price falls because not enough people are buying it. In this case, not enough people are buying those workers. They're not hiring them. So the first thing that falls is the price of workers or wages. First step in the adjustment process. Wages fall. Okay? Workers are out there having had a job maybe for quite some time and they're saying, yes, I'll take a pay cut if you'll just give me a job. And employers are looking around saying, whoa, I can replace this worker with that worker and pay less for my labor costs. And so there's a lot of downward pressure on, on wages. As wages fall, what does that mean for the business? It means their costs of running their business, their costs have fallen. And so in order to stimulate more sales, what can they do? Well, now they can afford to reduce their prices to attract more customers. Their costs are lower, so they can lower prices and still re retain a profit margin. And so the second step here is that prices, boy, this is messy, right? Prices fall, all right? When prices begin to fall, people start buying more products. And as they're buying more products, what's going on in the business? You're seeing more customers come through your doors. You're selling your inventory more quickly. You call your suppliers up. You order more inventory. Maybe you're so busy you have to hire some additional employees. If you're a manufacturer and your, your vendors, your retailers are calling you to, to order more goods, you need to produce more, so you need to put on more workers on the assembly line. So prices fall, sales increase, and as a result, we start hiring workers back. So unemployment begins to fall. And that's what's going on when you move down from B in the direction of C. That's what's going on down here. Lower wages, allowing lower prices. Lower prices, part three, means more sales. More sales means we need more workers. Which means we're now moving from our depression level of output and employment to more goods being sold and more workers being hired. 
And that process is also multiplicative. That is, as more workers get jobs, they have money and they spend more. And as they spend more, businesses produce more and need more workers. It repeats itself in a positive sense now. You have a positive spiral leading you back in this direction of point C. That when you finally get to the point of full employment, you've hired all those workers back, you've done so paying them lower wages, which is okay because prices are also lower. And you return to a full employment equilibrium where everybody is just as well off because even though prices are lower, or wages are lower, prices are lower, and they can still continue with their purchasing patterns. Now, this is the classical view, and when we moved into a depression, or maybe it's a recession, what is the role of government in managing this economy from its depression level, putting it back into a healthy operational mode? What is the role of government? And the answer from the classical model is nada, nothing. The government doesn't need to assist the economy. The economy is quite capable of self-correction. And so the economy self-corrects back to full employment. That's the classical model. It says the, the market is very efficient, it's very smooth, and if government interferes, all it does is cause harm. Therefore, we want a very small role for government. We don't want the government out there interfering with the natural adjustment process of the market. All right? Now, quick conclusion. Does that sound intuitively logical, appealing? And to a lot of folks, it certainly does. It makes absolute sense. I will leave you with just one question, though. If, in fact, this is truth, and we'll see it's debatable, if this is truth, how long does it take from the, for the economy to go from point B back to point C? How long will it take the economy to correct itself out of this depression or recession and return back? Because if it just takes a couple of weeks, this is pretty neat stuff. But if it takes six months or a year or two or three years, what's going on with the people in this economy for that one or two or three years? There's a lot of them down here without jobs, economically suffering. So there's going to be some painful uh, time in here as the market adjusts. And the question is, how long a time is that going to be? And what about those folks who are suffering? Okay. That's the classical model. Um, we'll pick up some more later. Bye.